Well, my, Mike had a vision quest. That's right. You know, he was like Loudon. He had a cause. He threw on the rubber suit. He started putting in the miles. He started lifting the weights. He started to listen to Journey. And fucking now he's on TV. That's how shit happens. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we love and growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your three co-hosts, Roger Roper, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And a very special guest star, one half of the Natural Nightmares. You can catch them every Wednesday night on TNT at 8 p.m. Eastern, AEW superstar QT Marshall. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm excited. (laughs) And uh, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we then break out our race car VHS tape rewinders and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes at the end of the podcast. The three of us will provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. You can also check out... Our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. You can find all the information on our past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. And finally, for everyone who craves all of our Shat, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShatTheMovies.com forward slash Twitch, where you can catch live content each week or past episodes on our YouTube channel. And if you have any thoughts or ideas or you want to write in about any of the movie reviews that we're doing today or in the past, you can write in hosts at shatthemovies.com or drop us a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT. Just put in Dropbox there and uh, we'll uh, we'll read those. So that being said, Big D, what movie are we doing today with our special guest star? So Roger, tonight is a special night. Occasionally when we get commissioned a movie that has a, a, a specialty, we like to go out and get the uh, the expert in the field. When we were doing, uh, I think it was Big Trouble in Old China, we got Cole Pickock, who had lived in Hong Kong for a year. When it was vampires, we got Gene Lyons. So tonight, one of our listeners, Nelson, said, I really like sports movies, the underdog tale. Uh, so he commissioned the 1985 high school wrestling sports underdog story, Vision Quest. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about it on the podcast before. I think we talked about when I went over to San Diego Comic-Con with my my wrestling friend, um, that was QT Marshall. And like not many people really truly understand your story or know your story. So for those who don't know you, can, can just give us a little bit of background because I think it kind of goes well with the movie that we're going to do tonight. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, when you're little and everyone tells you to be whatever you want when you grow up, and I didn't realize that they just say that <laughs> in hopes <laughs> that you go to college and all that mm-hmm. good stuff. So I did it. And uh you know, I started training wrestling in 2004, professional wrestling. And, you know, some more famous wrestlers opened up a facility down in Orlando. And um, luckily, uh, you know, I had waited tables. So I figured if I got a job in Disney, that would help, you know, pay the bills. And I went to the Team 3D Academy, which was out in Kissimmee. And I worked at Planet Hollywood. So that was kind of like when we all met and we're just chasing the dream, just like everybody else does. And Sometimes you give up and I'm just one of those people that I'm very uh, resilient, as they say, but I think it's more stubborn. And um, so but it's paid off. Dude, it's amazing. I'm constantly in awe of, of just your success. It's so cool because, like you said, many people just give up on their dreams and you never did. Sure. Yeah. Came close, but. Well, my, Mike had a vision quest. That's right. You know, he was like Loudon. He had a cause. He threw on the rubber suit. He started putting in the miles. He started lifting the weights. He started to listen to Journey. And fucking now he's on TV. That's how shit happens. It's pretty rad. Well, anytime someone sends in their hard-earned money to uh, have a commission done here at Shat the Movies, we ask them to write in a little message with some background on why they did. And uh, Nelson did that as well. So he writes in, hey, guys, I love listening to the podcast. And I'm so excited that you're reviewing my first commission movie. Mission Quest has always been special to me because it was a coming-of-age movie that took place around the time that I was coming of age. It also didn't hurt that Madonna's Crazy For You was the song playing the first time I slow danced with a girl. 
I also love the journey song, only the young from the film and watching it. Now I can see some obvious flaws, but it still tugs at those nostalgic heartstrings. I'm sure I'm going to enjoy hearing what you guys have to say about it. One final request though. I know you guys have been rotating a bit for reviews, but please, please make sure big D is part of this review. I love you all, but big D oh. is the man. Take care. Thanks again, Nelson. Well, I think Nelson, we did you one better. We got big D yeah. and we got AEW superstar QT Marshall. Well, Vision Quest is a 1985 American coming-of-age romantic drama film starring Matthew Modine, Linda Fiorentino, Michael Schofin, and Ronnie Cox. It's based on the Terry Davis's 1979 novel of the same name. Despite vehement advice against it from his father and coach, high school wrestler Loudon Swain decides to lose over 20 pounds in a very short time and attempt to take on the defending state champion of a lower class. Meanwhile, he falls for the edgy older Carla, who provides further distraction for the young wrestler. The film includes... As mentioned by Nelson, an appearance by Madonna in her first major motion picture playing a singer at a local bar where she performs the songs Crazy For You and Gambler. It was so popular that in some countries, the title of the film was changed to capitalize on her emerging fame and popularity of the song Crazy For You. The movie was released in the United States on February 15th, 1985 and went on to gross almost $13 million worldwide against a budget that I couldn't locate online. So before we dive into the movie and break it down for you, give you our opinions, we always ask the question, where were you? What are your memories of this movie? We'll start with you, Mike. So February of 1985, I was in my mother's womb and, uh, (laughs) you know, I was born in July, so I wasn't around. But I do remember watching this, but not really knowing what I was watching. Um, But then I did rewatch it, obviously, when I knew we had to discuss it and everything. So that's what I remember about it. I was sitting on my couch uh, only a week ago. So, uh, but I realized how many parallels I have with Loudon, uh, as I've kind of had a vision quest again in the past couple of weeks that we'll probably dive into later on. Yeah. How about you, Big D? Had you ever seen Vision Quest? So uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers the poster. You see the poster and you know the movie. But I kept getting this confused with Young Blood in my head. You know, the hockey movie. I thought, okay, you know, Loudon, he wants to be a wrestler. He stays with an older woman. She tries to seduce him. Uh, I was wrong. But as a kid, I don't remember the movie either. The only thing I remember is the soundtrack because Madonna started to become big. Uh, And that tape, that cassette tape I had, I wore that shit out. I mean, there was Journey on there, Only the Young. You had some John Waite. There was uh, Shout to the Top by Sile Counselor. Gambler was also on there for Madonna. She's on the Zoom from Don Henley. There was Dio. There was a Red Rider song called Lunatic Fringe. And then at the end, you had some Sammy Hagar, I'll Fall in Love Again. This tape was kick-ass, but really until rewatching it now, I, I thought this was uh, Youngbloods. Yeah, I had. Uh, I don't think I'd ever seen this movie, but I do remember watching the, the Madonna music video, which is essentially one big trailer for this movie. But I, again, I had never seen it uh, or remembered its existence. I think... Like Mike, I was too young and I didn't grow up a wrestler. I I was a baseball player. So this kind of missed my radar. Although if you're a wrestler, you probably grew up with this movie just like Nelson did. Well, with that being said, big D play of the trailer. At first, all Loudon Swain could think of was getting in shape. But since he met the girl. But give the guy a break. When you're in love, you can do some serious. And Swain is a high school wrestler who has just turned 18 and decided he needs to do something truly meaningful in his life. He embarks on a mission or in a Native American term, a vision quest to drop two weight classes to challenge the area's toughest opponent, Brian Shute, a menacing three-time state champion from a nearby rival Hoover High School who has never been defeated in his high school career. So even though I don't really remember the movie, there's parts of it I do. Uh, When he breaks out the pegs and tries to do the pegboard and climbing up the wall, I remember in high school being the fat kid and being like, yeah, I could do this shit. I maybe got two pegs, tired out and fell. And my only real memory, high school wrestling was not big in my school. I just remember how bad those mats smelled. And I could only imagine watching this movie as all these sweaty, hot young dudes are rolling around in the pit. And they're just getting all sweaty. How bad this room would smell. I could almost smell it through the screen. Well, Mike, on top of playing baseball for your high school, you were also a wrestler in high school too, weren't you? Yeah, I uh, signed up for wrestling to get out of class. That's why I signed up. We had a big test in Algebra 2. So I signed up. 
I only did it as a senior. Then my childhood friend, Mike, as well, got kicked off the team for getting arrested. So by default, I became a team captain. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I did enjoy the training aspect of it because I was losing weight. And as a fat senior trying to impress the young freshmen, it kind of did help out. (laughs) Well, well, here's my question, because a lot of kids, I guess, start wrestling younger. Uh, as a senior coming in, a little self, you know, a little, little insecure, the first time you wore that singlet out to the mat in public, did, did you feel a little naked? So now that I'm out in front of, you know, almost a million people every week in my wrestling trunks, which is basically <laughs> underwear. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, believe it or not. Yes, I was very <laughs> self-conscious. Um Luckily, our wrestling team wasn't that great, so you didn't get a lot of fans, Uh and most of our meets, as we would call them, were away. So we only did two home meets, so I didn't really have to, you know, but yeah, I was always worried about it, and oh, hey, should I stuff my singlet? Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, that I'm not the most well-endowed, but I'm not, so it was always one of those things, (laughs) and I was a late bloomer which makes it even worse. You know what I mean? So it was like, I'm always self-conscious, but I I realized that's what you had to wear. So I I would just say, okay, if I could just go out there and not lose, right. That was kind of my thing. And just, I just, but I did wear my warmups almost the whole time Mm -hmm. until it was time to wrestle. As long as you win, it's worth it to wear the outfit. Yeah. But you don't want to get humiliated in like 20 seconds and then have to walk back to the bench as your parents hang their head in shame. So real quick, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, My wife, who went to a different high school, she went to the private high school and I asked her to come watch me wrestle because I was in love with her since I'm 13 years old. And I wrestled heavyweight at about 208. The kid I wrestled was 265 and this kid mopped the floor with me. (laughs) Like literally he pinned me in about 34 seconds and it was the most embarrassing thing. But you know what? I do believe that everybody, if I have children, they will wrestle because you win or you lose. There's no team. You know what I mean? So like Mm -hmm. you have to shake that dude's hand afterwards after he pins you and you kind of have to, uh, you know, you have to realize what it's like to, to be a loser. And I think right now in America, you know, uh, in the world, I should say, where everyone's just getting participation trophies, I, I think it's it's good for you. It's good for uh, your your character. Yeah. Well, I, I always thought wrestling looks a lot of fun. It's just a bunch of dudes piling on top of each other in a circle. Like, what are the rules of wrestling? Like, amateur wrestling. I mean, I know if you get pinned, but what happens if you go outside that circle? Like, can you only be pinned in the circle? What are the actual rules of engagement? Yeah, basically outside the circle is out of bounds. Um, The person pinning, the person taking the other guy down, as long as his two feet are in, like his toes are in, almost imagine catching a football and you got to drag your feet. Right. As long as your your toes are in there, you're okay. Um, You can pin, you get two points for every takedown. On the flip side, you get one point for every escape. And then there's a tech fault, which is kind of like a mercy uh, if you're up by 15. So if you can't pin somebody because you just don't have the strength to pin them, you could basically just keep taking them down and letting them up, taking them until it becomes 30 to 15, and then you'll uh, win as well. So right. there are some rules and, uh, you know, some back points if you got the guy turned over. You know, that's, uh, I believe, another two points. So I wasn't good at that. It was either I pinned somebody or I got pinned. That, that's right. kind of how, you know, because wrestling at 208, I had to hope that there was going to be another guy that was wrestling heavyweight that just wasn't big enough. Um, or, and he wasn't good enough to wrestle 215 because <laughs> that's how I was. So the main character, Loudon, ha- he has to wrestle. He- he's going to this vision quest because he has to beat this guy, Brian Shoot. And at first I was like, how does everyone know this shoot guy? But once I saw him, I was like, oh, shit. Oh. He's like Ivan Drago in Rocky Four. He's fucking awesome. <laughs> I was simultaneously intimidated, but also slightly yeah. attracted to him. Did you guys get the same? Oh. Did you get the same feeling? Oh, fuck yes. Are you kidding me? So we always complain that movies portray teenagers or like 35-year-old actors. I'm telling you, Brian Shute, the actor, that dude is a man. And I'm going to call bullshit. There is no way that Brian Shute weighed 168. He is no. a fucking beast. And it's hilarious because Loudon tries to intimidate him. You know, he's, like, he's going to let him know that you're my vision quest. I'm coming for you. So they go, you know, him and Cooch, they go out and they see him. And this beast is putting in the work. He's climbing the stairs in the stadium. He's got a fucking telephone pole on his shoulders. He is the adversary that you need in these movies. This dude, he's all business. And he knows how to talk trash. Loudon's like, hey, hey. He's like, do I know you? 
you know, <laughs> and he goes, you going to make the weight? He goes, I hope so. And just keeps putting in the work. He's got his socks up to his knees. He is looking fucking fit. He's looking great. And then later on, he talks even more shit. He just rips loud into the ground. He says to him, he says, you know what? You're a bleeder. I like blood. 60 seconds. You and me on the mat. You're dog meat. This is the villain or the rival we all deserve in these movies. The crazy thing also is that we discover that Loudon has a side job. Like he works as well. In addition to his training, he's, is he a, a bus boy? Is he he's a waiter. like a waiter? Is he a waiter, a waiter or does he just deliver food? What the fuck's a waiter do? A waiter delivers food? No, no, food. no. But like, hey, I, well, wait a minute. I'm well, a, oh, I'm wait, a, hold on. I was on. a corporate oh, okay. trainer, uh, <laughs> by the way. And uh, I gave a guest the greatest experience they ever had uh, at Planet Hollywood. So <laughs> it's true. They did. Uh, but is a waiter also the same person that like delivers your food at the at like a hotel? Because that, that's what he is. I don't, I don't see he's him like ever waiting service. on tables. No, oh, he's, he's a room, room service, service guy. OK, yeah. but that that yeah. scene, that hotel scene where I, I guess this guy, Kevin, orders two pieces of pie and he yeah. delivers up to the hotel room. I was thinking to myself, is this, this going to be is this going to be a gay scene? Because they start talking about like Tai Chi and he opens up about his vision quest. And I'm like, uh, is it, are they really going to go here? And then I was blown away when they did, because for a 1985 yeah. movie, you don't expect that 15 minutes into the movie, there's going to be a gay proposition. Um, but like, has this ever happened to you guys? Is, have, you ever, have you ever been in a situation where some dude just grabs your wad? Uh, it happened to me in, at Mardi Gras once. Did it really? Whatever. Yeah, it's Mardi Gras. Oh, of course. Then the guy did it, and I was tripping on mushrooms at the time. So I was like, hey, it's Mardi Gras. Hey, party on, dude. Did he at least give you some beads for it? I think that's the currency. Uh, if you touch a guy's dick, yeah, you got to give him, no, I, I give guess him I, some beads. I, I, I wasn't worth beads. Oh, well. But the fact that we knew right away what was going on, Loudon had to have a clue. And I got that his disgust was fake. It was more him trying to be like, oh, what just happened? Oh, oh I'm really mad. Don't grab my wad. Yeah. Right. Didn't seem genuine. Now, I don't want to I, I don't want to get a lot of angry hate mails or, or tweets for this. But like, Mike, we worked in the service industry. Big D, you worked at Olive Garden. You, you had to work for tips. There are certain things that do you do to ensure that you get that 20, 25 percent, especially at Planet Hollywood, where, you know, again, I don't think anyone's I don't think I've ever been sexually harassed at Planet Hollywood. But I remember having to do things like puppet shows with the Mr. Hollywood, like to get the kids to laugh. Like, was there anything really bad that you had to do for a tip, Mike, that you just hated yourself afterwards? Yeah, I mean, you have to laugh at stupid jokes and all that stuff. But really, I mean, it's just about creating that connection with your table. So my trick was always asking where they were from and then having a bullshit story of how I could relate to them. Right. right. Like, oh, where are you from? I'm from Idaho. Oh, my God. My aunt lives in Idaho. I've never <laughs> been there, though. You know, like I can't wait to go there. And then they start telling you about Idaho. And I'm like, yeah, I'm weeded right now. I need to get uh, a <laughs> table, table 42 drinks. But uh, yeah, you could sit here and tell me your whole life story. I don't whatever. It is what it is, you know. But yeah, I mean, no one has ever done that. Uh, I did recently in 2016. I worked at a uh, at a bar, restaurant, pizzeria type place, uh, Neapolitan style pizzeria. And it was in a highly homosexual area. And I was getting hit on all the time. Yeah, I and, think it's flattering. It's flattering. Make yeah, you feel oh, great. Oh, yeah, of course. Say, how, how great did that make you feel? Yeah, I was like, oh, man, like girls and guys hitting on me. Yes. Like, I'm, doing, I'm doing pretty well for myself, really you know? Well, yeah. So, uh, it, you know, and as like I said, as long as uh, it was it was never in a negative way. So, no. yeah, you know, just like the way I would always hit on girls back in the day. It yes. just had to be done the right way you know you just can't offend anybody that's all no mike wants to be treated like a gentleman i remember that (laughs) when i was younger and i was that you know i was fit in the military i used to get hit on a lot and i took it as a compliment for someone to to go because at that point i could rip somebody's head off so for somebody to put themselves out there if i hit on a girl when i was single and get rejected the worst thing i'd be is embarrassed they could think this dude's gonna rip my head off is it worth it so i take it as something flattering so guys out there if a guy hits on you and he doesn't touch you, take it as a compliment. Well, Loudon visits his mechanic father, Larry, at the car dealership where he works and arrives after a scuffle between a salesman and a customer named Carla, who accuses the salesman of selling her a lemon. Believing Carla was exploited, Larry punches his coworker, and Loudon takes Carla out for a hamburger where she reveals that she used all her savings to buy a car to drive cross country to San Francisco to be an artist. Loudon is smitten and asks his father if Carla can stay with them until her car is repaired. She hesitantly accepts the offer. 
So I've already said that I have some questions about you know, some of the turmoil that's going on inside of Loudon's head. But his father also seems to be a bit worried about Loudon, you know, because he's doing a lot of things. He's trying to really be hyper heterosexual. He's trying to show everybody like what a man he is. He's writing a fucking school article on the clitoris. Then he goes to work and he talks with Elmo about the clitoris. And, and he's telling her what an amazing thing it is. He says, I want to be a, a gynecologist, a coos doctor in outer space. I'm like, what the fuck? Because I want to look inside of a woman and find the power that she has over me. He's caught sniffing Carla's panties later. He's he's talking about having a case of permanent erections. He brags to Carla, you know, about how often he has wet dreams and how great it is to wake up all wet. You know, I'm starting to think that his dad's a little bit worried. And I think that we should be worried that either he really is this over-sexualized or he's just a pervert. Yeah. What struck me again, because, you know, listen, we've all kind of been there, like where you're, you're searching for the attention and you've, you're, you've got all this testosterone going because, you know, you're, you're training hard and, and, and maybe, maybe as part of his vision quest, he wasn't taking care of himself. You know, maybe he wasn't, because isn't that a thing guys? Have you heard that where, I've There's a certain it. segment of the population that believes if you don't release yourself, if you don't need to do any kind of self masturbatory action, that, that somehow you'll grow your muscles faster or you'll be more athletic. Isn't that a thing? Have you heard, well, have you heard that? Well, you remember in something about Mary where he says you don't go off with bullets in the gun. You don't go on a date without jerking off because it takes the edge off. So I think mm-hmm. if, if, if jerking off kind of relaxes you a little, you know, it's like a, a late night cocktail. So maybe if you jerked off before a big match, you know, you're, you're a little drained, you're fatigued. You'd be more like, oh, I don't want to fight tonight. Let's, let's just go home. Well, Mike, you're from New Jersey originally, <laughs> right? Oh, God. Yep, I'm that, that's where would, I'm from. Would you, would you let a strange girl from New Jersey stay at your place, like one that you ever know, that you didn't know? Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I would, um, especially if she looked like Carla. But <laughs> – Here's the deal. I just realized another parallel, like I was explaining, the parallels end with the, you know, the article on the clitoris. <laughs> but, you know, the mechanic father named Larry, I mean, my stepfather was a mechanic and his name is Larry. And so this vision quest, I mean, we have just very similar stories. Um, if I had the option of inviting someone like that in, I definitely would do it. But when I was in high school, I wasn't allowed to have females sleep over. Because that was, you know, Larry was very old school, so I wasn't allowed to have female sleepover. But, um, you know, maybe if they looked like Carla, maybe it bended the rules a little bit. (laughs) Well, I'm not buying her story. She's supposedly on the way from Trenton, (laughs) New Jersey to San Francisco to be an artist, right? Why Mm -hmm. would she drive? So if you look at a map of the United (laughs) States, if you're going to go to San Francisco, you're going to go like through like St. Louis. You're going to go the archway. Down that way, I don't buy that she would go from New Jersey to Seattle, then down. And then what happened to her other car? How did she like? How did she get there? What happened to all of her money? I'm not. There's something off about Carla. Yeah, I, th- I thought she was a grifter. I thought one day they were going to come home and the Swain house was going to be empty, or the dad mm-hmm. was going to be murdered. There's something sketchy. She also didn't sound more like like a Jersey girl. You know, she should have sounded like Snooky or one of the other <laughs> Jersey girls. Uh, but no, I, I don't get it. And, and I don't know if the dad, Larry, wants her to stay with them to kind of help, you know, maybe Loudon become a man. But it's just this whole weird thing. She should, number one, say, no, this kid is giving me fuck me eyes out in this fucking diner. The dad is a creepy dude who has a violent temper because he just punched a coworker. I don't think this is the house I want to stay in. I'm going to sleep in my car. So I, I kind of believe that his father did want him to become more of a man. And this was his way of doing it and trying to yes. ex- expose it. Right. Cause right now he's looking at his son who's, you know, just shriveling away and he's just rolling around with other guys the whole time. And, you know, he's writing articles about the, you know, women's body parts. So yeah. I kind of feel for the dad cause he's, he really <laughs> wants his boy to become a man. Well, at school, Loudon collapses from dehydration. He's also starting to experience nosebleeds worried about Loudon's health. Carla visits him during wrestling practice and causes a stir among his teammates. Despite his hesitations concerning Loudon losing any more weight, the coach allows him to continue training after witnessing him complete the pegboard. And meanwhile, Carla goes on a date with Mr. Tannerin. 
Uh, okay, so first question, why is Carla there? Question two, <laughs> why the fuck is Carla still there? <laughs> right. This is like two weeks later. She's coming and going, and she's not a good house guest. She's going to the bar like until two in the morning with random dudes. She's coming home drunk. Why is she still there? Is Larry going to fix her car? Or is this a case where Larry's just stalling to try to keep Carla there longer? But she's now going on a date with Mr. Tanner. Time to go, Carla. Get out. I think she even like got a job. No, she didn't. At the bar where she went. No, she's right. not working. She, she's at the bar and then the guy yeah. like hits on her or whatever. Yeah, Madonna starts playing, you know, because I'm a gambler. Uh, and mm. then she's dancing and like o- overcomes Carla. And there's like some meathead dudes around the table. Right. And she's like, oh, those are my friends. So she's not working. Right. He's jealous. Yeah, because her friends are there and he knows that he yeah. can't stand a chance with the, you know, with those friends all there. No. Is, is she just toying with him? Because it seems like everyone is just fucking sabotaging his vision quest. Well, again, he's, you know, he's in the beginning of the movie. We see him. He's got journey on. He's running. He's wearing his rubber suit. He's eating right. He's doing all the things he needs to do. He's got to cut weight, get down to 168, you know, prove everybody wrong. If he wants to get on that sweaty mat with shoot, he's got to do all the right things. And all of his friends are sabotaging him. Cooch is jealous. Hey, I'm going to go drive to work. Get on my bike. Let's go home. You want to have a beer? No, let's have a cup of coffee. You know, he's training. Why are you trying to make it even harder? You know, Carla is fucking it up even worse. She's force feeding him junk food at the diner. She's keeping him out late at the bar. He's not getting his Z's. His muscles, they're not recuperating. He's no longer running back from work. (laughs) Now he's eating a late night hamburger with Elmo. No wonder he's not cutting weight and getting nosebleeds. Everyone in his life is sabotaging him. So right now, uh, as, as I was explaining, I'm on a vision quest to keep dropping weight and stuff like that. And when I go to uh, Cody's house, Cody Rhodes, who's my boss, but also a wrestler, uh, one of the most famous ones in our company, he has what he likes to call the snack basket. And Cody, being an amateur wrestler, two-time state champion, he has the discipline of, you know, he gets it. He can He can sit there and not eat anything, and he's good at that. I, on the other hand will devour the whole entire snack basket. So, and he always explains to me, he's like, well, just don't eat it. And I'm like, well, then just don't buy all the shit. Like, right. why do you have to put 17 packs of Sour Patch Kids and Reese's oh, and all this stuff? Evil. Like, right. And then we're going to sit around and play video games. So, and he's like, well, you don't really want it. No, I do want it. I just don't have self-control either. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's like. <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah, it's like my it's, wife and I. My wife and I, we have an agreement, Right. You don't put yourself in a dangerous situation and then shit doesn't happen. I love my wife, but if I go out to a club five days a week, late night, some shit, you might see somebody, you know, if you don't want something bad to happen, don't put yourself in that situation. Sour Patch Kids on the counter at night, you're putting on five pounds right there. I can't stop it. Uh, Do you think it's like mind games for Cody? Like, do you think he does this to train his mind? Like, do you think he also uses it as a way to like weed out people who don't want it? No, I think it's he genuinely loves to see people eat, right? Because he's not doing it. So (laughs) and my wife is the same way. And she's going to hear me talk about this. But like, Mm -hmm. she's a nutritionist. She has abs. Uh, It's absurd. And then she'll be like, I'll be like, hey, you know, I'm going to have ice cream tonight. And she'll be like, well, you probably shouldn't. I'm like, yeah, I really want it. Okay, go ahead, babe. And I'm like, wait a minute. There could be (laughs) millions of dollars sitting on the table for us if I just have a six pack. But at the same time, it's for her. It's like, it's satisfying because she's not going to do it because she has the willpower that I don't have. Right. And I, and I blame it all on my mother who used to feed me Reese's for breakfast. It's crazy because Loudon does the pegboard and like that apparently proves to the coach that he's healthy enough to, to wrestle. Meanwhile, his nose is bleeding. He's fallen over in the hallways. Like, how was is, how is the pegboard an accurate depiction of whether or not he's healthy or not? I know. And this comes right off of a meeting in his office. He's like, you're not doing it, Loudon. You're not going to hurt yourself. I need you at the bigger weight. And then he's like, oh, shit, he did the pegboard. OK, let's get him in there. <laughs> but, you know, he should be showing major concern. The nurse should be showing major concern. His friend should be showing major concern. These aren't just nosebleeds. These are gushers. He gets a nosebleed from a box of detergent 
that falls off of one shelf ahead of them and it hits them in the grocery store. So I start to ask myself, I'm like, okay, is there something going on in the plot here that I'm not aware of? Does he have cancer? Is he secretly sick? Is he cutting weight? Maybe is he doing drugs? Is he on Winstrol? Maybe is what is he doing some kind of drug to like really get ripped down? So I'm trying to wonder why no one else is asking these questions because he is bleeding like a sieve and he's not looking healthy. Mike, have you ever had to drop weight? I mean, I know you wrestled at heavyweight, but um, in your professional career, have you ever like had to cut weight really quickly? I've never gotten to the point to where I've been like sick like this or having nosebleeds. But like, you know, as a coach, I have a lot of athletes that don't know how to take a back bump, right? Which is where you just fall on your back, but we teach you the safe way. So you don't hit your head, you tuck your chin, all this stuff. And like, when I see that it's not going well, I obviously have to you know, Hey guys, let's take a break. Let, and then you get these stubborn ones, right? Like, like Loudon, he's stubborn. He, he wants to do this. I could do it coach. Like Rudy, remember Rudy? <laughs> I, I could do it coach. And it's like, no, you can't physically do this. Like I'm watching you. You're terrible at it, but you know what? The heart and the drive and determination, um, which, you know, that goes a long way. And as long as you're, you're safe about it. And I think, that's the part of the movie that we don't get to see. We don't get to see the fact that, okay, did he ever get his nosebleeds checked out? Like he just <laughs> right. was like, no. well, I'm going to ride this thing out. Like, no dude, Fuck like, man. you know, like a kid I had one time, he did a flip and he broke his arm and I'm like, Hey man, your arm is backwards. And he's like, no, I'll be fine. Like, no, you won't be fine. Like uh, another guy of ours, his bicep got torn and he's like, well, it looks a little weird, but I can still wrestle. And I'm like, no, you need surgery on your bicep. You know, he's like, well, I just got signed, you know, and I'm like, yeah, it's OK. Like you have a contract, you'll be OK, but get fixed. You know, uh, don't be like me. I have six screws in my neck and I didn't know until I was borderline losing my right arm. You know what I mean? So, right. Uh, again, yeah, I, I can't understand the coach like the pegboard for me was <laughs> A little Dude. awkward, you know, I would have rather you just, hey, coach, you have my word. I'm going to be safe about this. Not let me go do the pegboard and show you <laughs> yeah. that this is going to, you know, it's like, OK, Dude. whatever. Dude, no, no wonder the whole fucking team sucks. He's the first dude to do the pegboard in school history. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah. Rah, rah, cheering, going crazy. Yeah. Well, Loudon's father insists that he take a break from training to visit his grandfather out of town. Carla offers to join him on the road trip, and while camping, Loudon admits that he is a virgin, and Carla confesses that she and Loudon's teacher, Tannerin, are just friends. The next day, Carla kisses Loudon, and they make love for the first time. Afterward, Loudon wonders aloud why he cares so much about beating Shoot, but Carla encourages to confront his rival. Making love? Where the fuck was it? I wanted to see it. This is an 80s movie. I was expecting something. I mean, we see more of Shoot's body as he's stripping down. We even see Loudon's ass. And you don't show me anything? And I'm just calling bullshit. How far away does his fucking grandfather live that you actually have to drive on the road trip? You only get about halfway there. You stop the car on the side of the road. You set up a campfire and you sleep. I've never driven no. anywhere that required a campsite. Yeah, it, that was <laughs> the other thing. He's like, oh, I'm going to spend a weekend. And then the match is like next Monday or something like that. But it takes him two days to get there. How far away does he fucking live? Isn't that the whole point of Carla being in the car with him is so they can switch on and off just to get there? I'm, I'm even afraid to like stop at a rest area and sleep in my car. I'm not going to sleep at a, on the side of the road. No, no, definitely not. And, and their conversation on the road is kind of, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Carla, she's a potty mouth. She's a Jersey girl. And I find myself drawn to her. I don't know why. She is really just, she's got a, just a foul mouth. And she's telling jokes about, you know, he says, uh, I think Loudon says, oh, when we, you know, we're going to pass by a millionaire with a flat tire and I'm going to go help him. She's like, yeah, well, you're going to wake up with your asshole the size of the Lincoln Tunnel. I'm like, whoa, Carla, what are you, <laughs> what are you talking about? Because Carla's older. She knows what she's right. doing. She is driving this poor, horny teen wild. Earlier on when he's frustrated and he threatens to take off his towel and she says, oh, just what kids think, you know, a stiff cock is the height, height of romance. You say that to this dude who's telling you he's blowing off wet dreams every night. Is she trying to torment him or trying to give him the clue? Hey, make a move. Well, no, he, like his move is he talks about group sex with one of his friend's sisters. That's something you don't bring up. You know what I mean? Like that's, I wouldn't even, I would never talk about this again. Like he just sold out all of it. Like, uh, it was, it was kind of creepy. 
but also what was creepy is like as soon as they have sex, it seems as if that's all he wanted to do. Like that was the vision quest because as soon like the day after they're driving back, yeah. he's eating pizza. He's like, mm, I don't need to train. I don't yeah. need to wrestle anymore. What's going on here? Is this whole movie was just for him to have sex. I think that's what it was. He, he doesn't shut the fuck up about wrestling. Not once. There's a point early on where she's the first person who tells him, just shut up. I don't want to hear about wrestling. So now that he's already he has nothing else to talk about, he goes, I'm pretty good, wasn't I? No <laughs> dude who just lost his virginity to a 21-year-old artist from New Jersey so, who's like a grifter. No, dude, you were not good. Trust me. Carla has been with 14, 15 guys better than you probably since she's been in your dad's house. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, that's all Mike and I used to talk about when we were – when we were in the kitchen running trays. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. It was either we were talking wrestling or, or talking about how good he was last night. That's it. That's it, you know. <laughs> so his conversation with her afterwards, which is super awkward. I'm just watching that thinking like, no, you're not. She's She's been around, dude. Like, <laughs> like you're not God's gift to women. You know what I mean? Like, you literally got lucky and she was doing you a favor because she knew that that's probably the only way you're going to win this big match is if you blow this load. Exactly. And, and you know what? Maybe his stamina is great. He's been running. You know, his cardio is on point, but he's also knows he's got a hair trigger, so he's ready to go. But this is the weekend of the big match. You know, this is he's he's been dreaming about it. He's putting his health on the line. He's probably got some. He probably has maybe a tumor now. God only knows what kind of <laughs> illegal drugs he's been taking. Right. Where is the Rocky Siberian montage? We know right. that that shoots out there carrying trees up and down. We know, God only knows what he's doing. Why isn't Loudon out in the woods at his grandfather's farm, like right. doing sit up, sitting on the bench? Yeah. He's he's you know he's lugging his his dad's or his grandfather's old mule cart up the hill. Carlos training him like, yeah, come on, Loudon, do it, do it. He was picking up rocks. That's the shit this movie needed. Instead, they're sitting around cuddling. It's it, it totally defeats the purpose of his vision quest. Yeah, and his grandfather seems like a badass dude. Like, didn't he seem yeah. like, oh, I'm going to punch people? Like, he was like a boxer yeah. back in the day. You, you would, that's what you expect is going to happen is like, he's going to get him centered, focused, ready to go. And none of that happens. It's just he, he and Carla have sex and they drive back. And he's less focused than ever. <laughs> Diet out the window, training out the window. I'm surprised he even remembered what date the match was. <laughs> Well, Loudon returns from school to find Carla gone distraught. He nearly misses his way in at the match with shoot, but arrives at the last minute to learn he has hit his target weight of 168 pounds. Carla surprises him in the locker room before the match and apologizes for hurting him. She explains that she has left because she thought she was a distraction. And when Loudon tells her that he has no regrets, Carla emboldens him to win the match. Though suffering a nosebleed in the final seconds, his coach's pep talking and encouragement from his friends Loudon wins the match as the crowd cheers end movie. So we didn't get the montage, but we did get the scene with he and his coworker Elmo. It was kind of a, almost like a father figure. Again, it's weird that there was another father figure when he has his grandfather and his father. But anyway, Elmo was talking about Pele. And again, in yeah. 1985, America didn't care about soccer, but Elmo was like crying about remembering Pele do a bicycle kick. I mean, everyone's doing bicycle kicks, but again, I wish my parents talk to me that way to encourage my dreams. No, I, I love this part of the movie. You know, Elmo's the regular Joe. He's the dude pulling a 12 hour shift. He's living in what looks like a, a hotel or motel. The dude obviously has been through things in life and he's tried to mentor Loudon. I think this really hits. He is the dad that Larry mm -hmm. isn't. He's talking to him about, he's, he said, I'm not a soccer fan, but I saw something artistic, a thing of beauty. We have to find inspiration in our lives. And I think it's here where we should see Loudon. The light bulb should go off. Right. He should say, you're right. I'm going to take this. I'm going to motivate it. I'm going to get back to the way in. And instead, it really doesn't seem to have an effect on him. So I watched this part of the movie again today because it did have an effect on me because he went there and was like, huh, what do you mean you took off for work for this? It's just a silly wrestling match. Right. You know, Elmo, his... You know, he's been watching him train and, and you know, get ready for this quest. And it, it really hit home because obviously this whole dream of mine that has finally come true has been a quest for 34 years. And I've had people that sat on the sideline and watched and it was like, hey, do you mind 
tweeting this, hey, do you mind coming to this event? You know, and Roger, going back 12 years ago when we were at the Armory in Orlando, Florida, and you guys had to take off a night of work and spend $12 and come watch me perform in front of 100 people. And, you know, had I turned around and said something like, oh, you're really going to do that for me? And it was a touching moment in the film because he really, you know, he's teaching him a life lesson. And, I think more importantly, that's what he needed. And maybe his father wasn't good at articulating that or his grandfather. But yeah, that, that, that moment really hit home for me. And, um, you know, and then you see him in the crowd afterwards. And I just love that he gets to the place and, you know, he's got nicks on his face with the toilet paper attached to his face yeah. because, you know, he's bleeding. He's trying to really jazz himself up, you know, just to go support his coworker because yeah. Yeah. he believed in his vision quest. Uh, he even gets dressed up. And I want you to know, Mike, this is the first time we're talking in probably like nine, 10 years, right? I want you to know that your career and what's happened to you has had an impact on me because I've watched from the sidelines. I remember when we first bet, you're like, oh, I'm going to be a wrestler. I'm like, okay, when's this fucking dude going to get a real job? Come on. How long is this going to last? Okay. And then as you fought through your dream and you kept pushing it and I watched you continue to climb, it's been impressive to me. And it's made me realize that when I hear friends, family, people around me who have these dreams that seem crazy, instead of me in my mind shitting on them, I should I should do the Elmo. I should try everything I can to drive people towards that goal, because as ridiculous as it sounds, shit, it's possible. You know, it really is possible. So I am I'm proud to know you and I'm proud where you are now, because the intestinal fortitude it took to fight through the armory and all those beginning wrestling matches, dude, that's like what Loudon's doing here. And, and, and I think it's our job as older people to teach the kids. Not everything is fucking rainbows and unicorns. You got to work. You got to fail, but keep going for your dream. So, Mike, let me ask you a question. There was another guy that we, it was a co-worker of Planet Hollywood and I that, that was pushed early on. Like he got the chances to do like when he was young, like within the first year of him wrestling. Remember that guy? He had the. He, he wrestled for TNA. We don't have to say the name or anything like that, but do you remember him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesse. Yep, yeah. And he flamed out, right? He's not doing it anymore, is he? Right. And yeah, no, he's not. He's trying to. He actually emailed me not too long ago looking for a job. Um, right. And I don't, you know, I don't, I can't give people jobs. I could barely get myself the job. But <laughs> yeah, one of those things that a lot of people don't realize and, you know, on the vision quest is that you just, like Big D was saying, somebody's going to do it. Right. Right. Like somebody's going to be on TV every Wednesday night, but it does take a lot of hard work, determination. You have to figure out, you know, and a little bit of luck as well. Um, But that's what I explain to every single one of these athletes that I have here is it's guys, this is not easy. Right. Like that's why that's why there's only, you know, two hours of TV and stuff like that. And like this guy dropping weight, you know, loud and dropping weight to go beat the rival shoot. Who's this undefeated wrestler? Like it's not going to be easy. And I think. Along like my documentary, right? And I'm going to kind of tie these both together. My documentary hit home because it wasn't just about a guy that was trying to be a wrestler. It was about a guy that was trying to live out his dream and showing the obstacles that he had to overcome while his family was going against him. Everyone, And when it seems like everything is going wrong, you have two options. You can either give up or you can keep going. And Eventually, when you keep going, you, sometimes it's just about persistence and right outlasting everybody else. And this is kind of what he did in this in this scenario. And um, that's why I said like that moment really hit home. And then obviously, you know, the happy ending of him winning at the end that was great as well. Because sometimes you don't win, like I didn't win, you know, the other night on Dynamite. <laughs> but you know, like I said, I think it was a it was a great way to really teach someone to keep going. Right when you want to give up, yeah. you just got to keep going. So, Rod, you mentioned you don't know what the budget was for this film, but I have to imagine that they probably blew at least 50% of it on that journey in Madonna song because they used them no less than three times. Only the young, we get that song three times with the mm-hmm. lyrics and a fourth time an instrumental. Crazy for you, we get it four times. And I think they were forced to at the end. We get this final big climactic scene. Loudon's climbed the mountain. He's going to he's going to battle shoot. Do we get some new song to really do? We get the eye of the tiger, something to fire us up. We get what I can best describe 
as the theme to like a 1985 Nintendo game final boss, it sounded like like Castlevania, like I was like, shit, it killed all the drama. He finally wins, and then we get Journey for a fifth time. Um, you left out Lunatic Fringe by Red Rider. That's the song that pumps me up every single time. Like that's the one you want on your playlist when like you're you're running. But uh fun fact, did you know who was in the band Red Rider? Tom Life is a Highway Cochran. And that song is actually about uh the resurgence of anti Semitism in the nineteen seventies. Dude, dude <laughs> I, I had okay. no idea. Okay, you gotta tell people now who Tom Cochran is. Cause fucking Tom people Cochran gonna... people have seen cars. It's the theme song of Cars. No, you guys haven't seen Cars. Life is a Highway. Tom Cochran. All right. Well, he's in Lunatic Fringe. Wow. I've been living in a wrestling bubble for the past 34 years. (laughs) Yeah. Pixar has yet to make a movie about about wrestling. Yeah, I don't picture wrestlers getting all pumped up for the big match. Be like, life is a highway. I'm going to take you all night long. No, I don't <laughs> it was it. covered by a country singer <laughs> yeah, not too long ago, I think. Anyway, but like, is this movie really like, Mike, I think you put it beautifully that like, Loudon shows a lot of uh, resiliency and persistence and uh, achieving his goal. And, and ultimately he, he does that hero's journey where he wins at the end. But is this movie really about wrestling or is it about something else? Uh, I think this is a journey more spiritually of him to become an adult because he keeps saying I haven't experienced much. And I said earlier on that I'm having a sense that there is an internal conflict with Loudon with who he is. And right. he's trying to compensate for something by by being over sexual, the clitoris. And he's talking about it with everybody. I mean, he talks about sex with everybody more than wrestling. Even when it's awkward, he talks about it. When he has that encounter with the hotel guest with the Tai Chi, he seems conflicted. His anger seems disingenuous. You know, he tells Cooch, oh, yeah, I freaked out. The guy grabbed my wad. Like, it's not something a normal teenager would say. And the camera always lovingly looks at shoot. It always, like, the the shots of shoot are, like, panoramic. They're, like, cinematic. They swoop in on his muscles and his body, and he's oiled up. There's a scene where before the final match and shoot confronts Loudon and the camera switches to the POV of Loudon as Shoot walks away. The camera is now looking through Loudon's eyes. It slowly focuses in on Brian's tight acid wash jeans, his butt, and it just it's it's a loving gaze as he walks away. I think that the movie is subtly telling us that this is not just a battle to win in the ring, it's a battle for him to figure out who he is. And if you don't believe me, there is a, an article that I'm going to put a link into the notes. It's called The Queer Beauty of Vision Quest by Ken Moorfield. And it goes in detail. And it's not like a, hey, he's gay because, you know, one of the guys right. on this yeah, team yeah. was called Balldozer. Or early in the movie, one of the guys said, I'll give you something to suck on. No, it's a real in-depth breakdown of the movie and about possibly some of the internal conflict. But from what I understand, the LGBT community really embraces this film. I was going to say, I could totally see that, you know, beyond just the story of, you know, someone achieving a goal and, and putting their mind to it and doing that. Th- this is almost him overcoming and understanding maybe this is who he is sexually. I, I could totally see how this movie is embracing because it doesn't it doesn't try to hit you over the head with it. But again, if you look through that lens and completely out of context, it looks like shoot really enjoys cuddling up to Loudon, which, again, I think well, goes along with this article. Shoot to cock tease. Shoot knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> shoot knows exa- shoot. He could tell I was watching him on the screen. I felt like he was mm-hmm. doing it to me. Yeah, I, yeah. He, he's a good looking dude, my, Mike. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. yeah I mean, Ooh, he's he's got a lot of muscle definition that uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get. I mean, honestly, you know. I mean, you know. So, Mike, in high school, did your teammates look like uh, shoot? Because we get that scene where Loudon's trying to cut weight, and you know, and he drops his pants, and all these these young boys are there. They all look pretty fit. Was that your high school team? Okay, one wrestler, <laughs> and now he's uh, yeah, he was he became a bodybuilder, and now he owns a meal prep company that uh, I actually got you know Cody Rhodes hooked up on, and uh, 
But yeah, he was the only guy that, but he looked like a, like he looked like a pro wrestler. And I was like, man, I got to look like Jamie. Jamie is like, <laughs> you know, and I just remember like every time he'd weigh in, cause he, he wrestled 215. So he was always right before me. And I'm just like, God, this guy's like a Greek God, you know, like, how, and then I'm like, well, I don't want to stare at him. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. uh, you know, and then, uh, so, but, uh, yeah, there was not too many shoots in, on my team. It was all just a bunch of, bunch of mics, you know? <laughs> so like on those tough weigh-ins, you know, where you're, you're borderline going to make weight and you, you drop your pants in front of the team. When you made weight, would everybody be like, yeah, dog pile, Mike, woo? Or yeah. would they be like, hey, put your pants on first? <laughs> so luckily I was like, again, I, since I wrestled heavyweight at such a lightweight, I was just eating beforehand. So it didn't matter for me. <laughs> but Jamie was always right on the cusp. And I remember him like before the weigh-ins, like running around with his wetsuit on, his track suit, and, uh, you know, getting all the water weight out of him. And then, yeah, I mean, like – they would all hug and I'm just like, dude's in his underwear. Like, what are you guys doing? You know, or, or he was completely naked and I'm just like, Oh, I'm, you know, like, I, Hey, not, Hey, Go that's not team. High five. High yeah. Five. Yeah. That's just not nothing me. Nothing wrong you know? with that. Yeah. Not, nothing no, wrong nothing with wrong with it. It just wasn't my cup of tea. So, uh, so here's the biggest thing that nobody's mentioning. Loudon's body <laughs> is absolutely terrible <laughs> compared to shoots. I mean, Awful. he's just tall and lanky. And I mean, even in the single, it's just, I don't understand. Mm. Like, I get it that you have to cut the actual weight. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you stand them next to each other and it's just a mismatch. It's a mismatch right away. This has to be a fact that Matthew Modine either refused to lift weights or couldn't cast somebody else. Go find some actor who looks the part. You know, you can't have like a story about a, a let's say a basketball player and the dude's fat. Have him look the part. You know what I mean? But I want to play here right now. We're going to rewrite the ending of the movie. Or we're going to rewrite okay. part two. Okay. Good. So now we have Loudon. He's he's climbed the biggest mountain. He's no longer a virgin. He seems to be kind of coming to a, a place where he's questioning life and realizing that our time on earth is not finite. We should take every day, really enjoy it. He's beaten shoot. He's now, he's not even at the state championship. So this is just a regular match. Has he peaked? Where does the sequel go? G give me like a quick idea of your Vision Quest Part 2. Okay. Vision Quest Part 2, to me, looks like this. He's in a rehab. <laughs> he has <laughs> – his whole life has fallen apart because what's going to happen is, yeah, he's peaked, right? So yeah, he's peaked. got the hot chick. He won the big match. Where do you go from here? And me, being a, a professional wrestler, there is no better high – than having uh, an audience full of people going crazy for what you're doing. And this is basically where it all comes comes down to it. Like every rock star, every actor, you just want to always find that high. So unless he's going to continue to have these vision quests that he's going to go after, the chase is what everybody loves. Everybody loves a great chase. It's the same reason why a lot of, of humans don't like staying settled with one person. Because you just love the chase. Everybody loves the adrenaline of trying to get that chase. And I, I do. I think he he peaked out. The opening of Vision Quest 2 is him sitting there speaking with a psychiatrist who's trying to get him <laughs> clean. And he's, he's trying to figure out what is next. And the biggest thing I think that I could take away from this is, um, you know, always know what you want next, right? You should always have that vision board. Or else you'll, you'll just, you know, you kind of <laughs> trying to get that high again is very difficult. I don't know if I would do a sequel to this, but I would have rewritten the ending. No, I'm not, I'm not letting you rewrite the ending. This no, is my fantasy world. Hold I want, on. I want part two. All right. Well, it, it would obviously center around Cooch and, okay. and his own, <laughs> like him finding himself. Because okay. I think the, the ending of the movie should have been him realizing that all this detriment that he's doing uh, has distracted from the fact that his best friend is in a terrible situation where he's being abused by his father. And uh, he had to make up a whole story about being native American just to be liked. And he took Cooch's spot on the team. I think he and Cooch are training all throughout the movie. He finds out that his father's abusing him. And at the final, instead of battling shoot, he lets Cooch take his place against shoot and Cooch wins. Mm. And I think the vision quest is that ultimately you can't be selfish. You got to help your friends. And and that's the whole, that's the whole quest. And it, it, and then part two is all about Cooch. 
Okay, so you gave us the Disney version. I'm going to give you the dark <laughs> R-rated. Okay, in mine, it starts off at the state championship, and Shoot has just doubled down. He comes in ready to go, and he humiliates Loudon, kills him, wins the states. So now we have Loudon. He's down on his luck. During this time period, the abuse with Cooch gets worse, and Cooch ends up fighting back one day, kills his father. So now he's arrested. Cooch is on trial. And then this is only compounded and getting worse that Carla just one day picks up and goes. Because now Loudon's a loser. He's down on his luck. He's getting fat. He's sitting in the basement. He's now out of high school. He's got no dreams because whatever, his vision quest came to an end. And I think that's when it finally gets really tragic and he finds out that he has cancer. And he's on his deathbed. He's got nothing left. Carla comes back at the end as he's you know, he's his last gasp. And she she says, I always loved you. I missed you. And he says something like, I thought about you every day of my life. Fade to black. That's it. It's getting dark. Jeez. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. I could, to- hey, uh, I'm not going to lie. Big D, I could see that happening. <laughs> it's kind of similar <laughs> Kind of similar yeah. to, you know, I mean, yeah, you're just going to hit a dark place. And then you're not worried about your what you're eating. You're not taking care of your body. <laughs> no. And then the big C just shows up and puts you in the hospital. Yeah. I get it. No, yeah. I completely understand. It's got to be dark because there's nowhere else to go when you're up at that high. And your peak is so narrow. There's nothing else for him to do other than just fall off. Or it could be revealed that the coach wearing a singlet was abusing yeah, the boys. Of course. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. There you go. Really dark. You, you love know? it. Well, now it's time for the podcast where we break out our chat meters, give you our wipe scores. If you've never listened to the podcast before, a zero wipe movie is absolutely perfect. And a five wipe movie is uh, is a nose bleeder. It's uh, just absolutely terrible. Uh, we'll start with you. Mike, you're our guest here. Uh, how many wipes do you give Vision Quest? So I give it a three and I know that's probably the most common answer. I give it a three because the movie itself, it was okay. The message was really strong at the end. And I thought it would have been a lot of, it probably would have been more of a four or five, except for, I'm telling you, the Elmo scene got me at the end. It really sucked me right back into the story. Yeah, I I agree with you. This has all the hallmarks of an 80s teen movie has the hero that has to overcome something, a woman just out of reach, a blue collar father that wants to do the right thing for his son, uh, a a geeky best friend. Who's the editor for the school newspaper. That's in love with him and an album that's better than the actual movie itself. But I can't keep thinking to myself that there's something off about this movie. Like it's not good. Like the pacing is a little strange. Like how many scenes of loud and running over a bridge did we really need? How many high school wrestlers have watched this movie and killed themselves trying to do the pegboard and and cut all this weight? And why does Matthew Modine act like Crispin Glover's portrayal of a young George McFly? Also, I think the heavier moments of Cooch's father abusing him weren't handled properly. And I think, again, the ending that I that I set out and obviously more scenes like he has with Elmo and maybe a a montage of him training with his grandfather would have helped a little bit more. Um, And I know this is based on a book and all that kind of stuff, but. Ultimately, I agree with you, Mike. I don't think it's that good of a movie, though there are scenes that if I was a wrestler and I was trying to do this, I could see where this movie would be really good. But ultimately, that's not what this podcast is about. It's about, is this movie good or not? Does it stand the test of time? I don't think it does. I think it's below average. I also am going to give it three wipes. So that leaves you, Big D. How many wipes do you give Vision Quest? So I'm a big fan of sports underdog movies, and I think they all have certain things in common and they follow a normal path. I mean, no one was surprised at the end, like, oh, my God, Loudon won. Holy shit. We all knew that was going to happen when the movie started, right? There's very few movies that subvert your expectations. Kingpin being one when Roy Munson at the end actually loses. So we knew he was going to win. So it's about how we got there, right? First thing, rival. His rival shoot is perfect. That is the dream high school rival. Johnny is kind of campy and, 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 you know, high school. He's a boy. This is a dude who's all business. He's not a caricature. He's an actual badass wrestler putting in the work. And he is somebody who really loud and should attain to knock down. But what I think he needed was a mentor. Elmo is a coworker who supports him and he's mentoring him on his development as an adult, as a man. That's great. But where was his trainer? Where was his Miyagi? We need the Miyagi who says, Loudon, what are you doing? You're eating burgers. This Carla's bad for you. It's This is the weekend you got to train. Why are you going away on a three-day camping excursion? We needed the mentor. We needed at least one or two training montages. Him running back and forth across that bridge to work? Bullshit. I need more than that. He's got to be lifting weights. 
more than just that one time where he's in that sorry ass high school gym. Let's see him putting in the work. That's what I wanted to see. And I also needed to know, establish that Loudon is formidable in the ring. We only see him fight twice. He gets a nosebleed in both, and he doesn't look like much. Show us why he is the, what, 190-pound champion or whatever he was, the best in that division. Show me why. And I think the movie just gets lost along the way. Is it about him chasing his virginity, finding out who he is sexually, you know, growing up in the house with his father? and just, It's just too many things. Trim it down by 20 minutes. Make it about his journey to be a champion and follow his dream. Carla's a distraction. The mentor puts him back on the path. And I think it would have been great. It's not that movie. So I think it's a 3.5 wipe. So if we were to add up uh, two threes and a three and a half and then divide by three, that gives you our overall chat ranking, which is what, Big D? Uh, so, Roger, with a 3.5 and two threes, that comes out to an average score of 3.16. So that now puts Vision Quest alone in the 118 spot. It is slightly better. And when I say slightly, very little better than Escape from New York, Strange Days and Videodrome and slightly worse than the Boondock Saints. Armageddon and spies like us. So it's in that bottom two thirds, nothing special, nothing great. But I will say this Austin 316 says, I just whooped your ass. So we tied it all back to pro wrestling. So I'm happy with it. Mm -hmm. That was not, that was not planned at all. That was, I, that was not planned at all. That's great. I'm I'm not that good at math. (laughs) Well, that does it uh, for this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Again, thank you, Nelson, for commissioning Vision Quest. Big D, what movie are we doing next? So, Roger, next week it is one of those pantheon of Shat movies out there on Mount Rushmore. This is a movie I can't believe it's taken us three and a half years to get to. Uh, It is the 1992 film whose tagline is, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll hurl. And it is uh, the big screen spinoff of the Saturday Night Live skit. Rob Lowe plays a producer that wants to take the public access Wayne's world to the world of commercial television. Wayne played by Mike Myers and Garth played by Dana Carvey battle to save their show and Wayne's girlfriend from Lowe. It was commissioned by Steve W. It came out in February of 1992. And this is one of those movies that I think everybody knows and most people love. Yeah. So uh, wait to the end. If you don't know what that is by now, mm-hmm. wait to the end. We'll, we'll play the trailer again. Thank you, Nelson, so much. Um, thank you, Mike. QT Marshall, yeah. man. Uh, I know it's late where you are. I, I know that you have a, a very patient wife that's waiting for you to be done with all this. But yeah, I have a, my students are just going crazy in the other side of the facility <laughs> right now. I hear them. They're fighting. I literally I just saw a, a girl just storm out of the room and i don't know what's going <laughs> oh my on oh so my she dates one I'm of the so wrestlers sorry. so i'm sure they got into it about something you know so it's okay though where where can people find you where can people download your movie give us all your uh your so, mentionables yeah the movie is uh like i said amazon.com uh amazon prime best buy.com walmart.com but you can catch me on all elite wrestling a new league on tnt every wednesday at 8 p.m um, also, we have AEW Dark, which is our YouTube show that comes out every every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. On Instagram, it's the real QT Marshall and Twitter, the real M Marshall one. Um, so anywhere, follow me. Have, have, you know, like I said, I hope I'm a, a big inspiration to a lot of people that, uh, you know, you put the hard work in and good things will happen. So and just be a good person, of course, as yep, well. That, yeah. that really goes a long way. Um, you know, there's a lot of non-talented people that make it pretty far in life just by being a good person. And, you know, I try to instill that in everybody as well. I think what's also cool about your documentary is that it was produced and shot by one of our other friends that wanted to do a documentary. Like it was his own goal to do a movie and he happened to do it about you and he, and he went on to win an award. It's a great movie. I saw it screened at at, at San Diego Comic Con. If you, if you have Amazon Prime, it's free, right? It's part of your subscription. I highly suggest you watch it. It really is a good movie, and it really is a good story. And it's so cool to just see how far you've come. And as an early supporter and continued supporter, it's just so cool to to see the progress you've made and, and see you where you are. It's so awesome. I brag about you a lot. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. Very nice to to see you again. Don't be a stranger for this long. And I totally agree. Surround yourself with good people. 
surround yourself with people who want to see you succeed because the haters out there, they just want to see you fail. So I'm, I'm proud of you, proud to know you, and glad uh, the success you've had. Thank you very much, guys. I had a lot of fun. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Shout the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere, including Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Just follow the handle Shat the Movies. Again, that email, if you have uh, different opinions of this movie's uh, Shat score or any of our past movies, you can email us your thoughts with uh, the title Dropbox. Just email hosts at shatthemovies.com or send us a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT. You can support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey so we can sell it to advertisers. You can buy our merchandise uh, or you can commission your own movie. All the information is on our website, shatthemovies.com. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information at shatontv.com. Thank you again so much for listening. Um, thank you, Mike, for joining us. Thank you, Big D, for being a good person. <laughs> and and uh, it's so cool to surround myself with you two uh, in my life. It's uh, You're an inspiration to me to keep going. So that concludes it. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Good night and good luck. And stay the fuck at home. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolt and lightning. Just outside of Chicago. Galileo. Galileo. The basement of this house. It's Wayne's World! Wayne's World! Party time! Excellent! Broadcast history is about to be made. Extreme close up! Wow! I want you to find out who these guys are and where they do their show. What is this? Mr. Vanderhoff, this is your audience. It's two chimps on a Davenport in a basement. Here I am with the contract for $5,000. Excuse me? No. They're on their way. No way. Way. To fame. Will you still love me when I'm in my carbohydrate sequin jumpsuit? Young girls in white cotton panties, bloated, purple, dead on a toilet face. To fortune. Contractor knows. I will not bow to any sponsor. <laughs> and to babe heaven. Shoo! Arie, 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 arie. What do you do if every time you see this one incredible woman, you, you think you're going to hurl? I say hurl. If you blow chunks and she comes back, she's yours. If you spew and she bolts, it was never meant to be. Okay. It's Wade. This is definitely the type of place I'm going to get when I move out of my parents' house. It's God. I love you, God. If she were a president, she'd be Abraham Lincoln. It's a movie. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Wayne's World. It just might be the greatest motion picture ever made. Are you mental? The Elzebub has a devil put aside for me, for me. Wayne's World.